Pastor Chuck, we're super excited to have you on today. And uh, I want to tell you, this is one, I know you're going to want to do this. You're going to want to share it. And you're going to have other people see too, because what we're going to be talking about is so interesting, so interesting. And it's also something you can get involved in, uh, something you can make a difference in. And in times like this, we need to make positive differences for Jesus. Uh, by the way, even if you're not a Christian, you've got to hear this. Okay, you got to hear. So I have a guest I cannot wait to have you meet. His name is Ray Slayman, Dr. Ray Slayman. I uh, was a doctor for over 40 years. Now he's a pastor and uh, he's Lebanese and has a real heart for Lebanon. And uh, uh, after I think all of you guys know this on um, August the 4th, Beirut was rocked by a horrible explosion that devastated their port, killing over 100 people, injuring over 5,000 people and leaving many, many, many people home. Uh, it's one of the most devastating explosions to have rocked anywhere in the world. And uh, so now is the time we can make a difference. And uh, Ray is someone who's making a difference. And so we're definitely going to talk about that. Uh, but I, I want you to hear more of his story and how God moved in his life. And so right now, uh, I am excited for you to meet uh, and love for you to welcome with me uh, Dr. Ray Slayman. And so, Ray, it is so good to have you on. Thank you so much, Pastor Chuck. What an honor and what a privilege to be with you. Thank you very much. Okay, so probably one of the most important things to ask you is uh, my assistant, Tracy, uh, is Lebanese, and you've known Tracy since she was a baby, uh, which I think is so cool. It's amazing. So, so blessed to see how Tracy have grown and have dedicated her life to the Lord and how she's working with you now. Praise God. Yeah. Now, I think she's probably one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. Has she always been that way? I think so. Since she was a kid, she will make statements like nobody else. She was always ahead of the crowd. But it's amazing how she grew so fast, Pastor Chuck. It's amazing. Okay, I think so, too. And I love that you got to be a part of her life. Ray, um, I had asked you this question before, and I, the answer to me is incredible. So I can't wait for you to everyone else to hear the answer. But my question I asked you was, uh, were you raised a Christian or did you convert to Christianity? And how God got a hold of you is incredible. So would you share that with us? Amen. I'll, I'll try to be quick, but I was raised in a traditional church. And uh, no, I did not know uh, 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 Christ, nor did I ever have a Bible in my hand. So uh, having finished my training and my medical schooling in Lebanon, I came to the United States to continue my training in urology and continued at St. Louis University and left after that. I wanted to go back to Lebanon, but I couldn't. There was a raging civil war. In fact, the longest civil war on record. Uh, and I came to California. I loved the weather and the beach and the mountains. I said, this is the place to stay. And I started my life here. And uh, I hate, hate to say this, but at the time, I decided I'm going to live the good life as a single man, and I wanted to indulge in whatever I could. So my actions were between California and Las Vegas, going back and forth, working and having fun, etc. And then as I advanced in this life of complete, complete uh, being seduced by the fun and, and, and games of life, etc., I became scared of my own self because I saw my life going from bad to worse and more worse year after year. So I became like this one day. I was scared. I said, where am I going to be in a few years from now? And the thought of me being found dead in one of those bad places terrified me because I figured my mom is going to hear about it. And what a disappointment she's going to say where my son has ended. So with that, being afraid of my own self, I realized I was no longer in control of my life. I, just, I was just after sin, more sin, and more adverse sin. So with that in mind, one night, I was no preparation whatsoever. I was in my bed preparing for another night on the town, and I hear this very distinct whispering voice in my right ear and could never forget that voice. It said softly, gently, but very clearly, open the Bible. To say the least, I was shocked. I was surprised. 
I started analyzing as a doctor, how can somebody hear a voice in his ear? I decided something is wrong with my brain. And then I said, I hope it's not a be beginning of a disease where you start hearing voices. And then I was captured by the voice itself. I said, it's not a bad voice after all. It's telling me to open the Bible. So I remembered at that time, somebody gave me a Bible and it was sitting on my shelf for the last seven years, never opened. So I went and reached for that Bible. And uh, uh, that's why, Pastor Chuck, I always like to give people hardcover Bible. Because I figure if they leave it on the shelf for seven years like me, there's a chance they know where it is. <laughs> so I picked up the Bible and I wanted to open it. I didn't know where to open it. So I said, I wish somebody would tell me where to open the Bible. So I picked up the phone and called somebody else. I said, where do you open the Bible? And the voice came to me, Romans. I said, what is that? And that was a lady I was calling. She said, you don't know Romans? I hung up. I said, I'm really a dummy in the Bible, but I'll find it out. I'm so, so smart. I always looked at myself as very smart. So I said, wait a minute, I can find it out. And I found Romans. And I sat, I said, I'm going to read. And then I'll satisfy that voice that told me to open the Bible. And I start telling people I've read the Bible. So I start reading in Romans. And it looked like a nice story about someone by the name of Paul. I figured that's a nice story book. And shortly after came a verse in Romans, verse 18. And as I was reading it, I could hear the thunder in that verse. It said, for the wrath of God is declared from heaven against all unrighteousness, ungodliness of men who suppress the truth with their unrighteousness. I became shaken by that. I looked at the verse. I said, God is angry. I wonder who he's angry with. But I decided within me it couldn't be me because, after all, I'm not that bad of a guy. Whatever I do, I do it in secret. I don't bother anybody. People know me as a doctor, so I'm not that bad. And I started reading in Romans chapter 1, the rest of the chapter, and I read in Romans chapter 1 about 22 sins that make God angry. And as I was reading them, Pastor Chuck, I was looking at each one and I saying, this one I'm doing, and this one I'm doing, and this one I'm doing. And this one, it turned out I was doing every single one of those 22 sins that anger God. At the end of the reading, Romans chapter 1, I was so scared that the book shook in my hand, literally. I was holding a book that was shaking in my hand. And I decided, I'm so scared. If this book is telling the truth, I am heading to hell guaranteed. And I thought, I figured I want to forget what I read, but I couldn't. And I tried to, decided, I decided I'm not going to go out tonight. I can't go out and party when after I've read what I've read. So I decided to sleep early and forget that I've touched this book. In fact, I decided to tell my friends never to touch this book because it's a scary book. <laughs> and as I was trying to go to sleep, I touched to the right and I hear a little whispering in my voice, you are a sinner, you are going to hell. And I go to the left, it's the same voice. And to the right, I spent one of the worst night of my entire life. The next morning, I got up so exhausted, and I took a shower, and I could hear the voice under the shower. You are guilty, you're a sinner, you're going to hell. I went to my car, and I put the music as loud as possible, and the voice was stronger than the music. You're guilty, you're a sinner, you're going to hell. I arrived to work, and I remember in that one hospital, and I had dated many of the nurses there, one nurse looked at the other. She said to me, doctor, you look pale. Are you okay? I didn't answer anything. The rest of the day, Pastor Chuck, people talk to me. I can't hear them even. The voice was going, you're guilty, you're a sinner, you're going to hell. The, the day was over. I couldn't wait to rush back home. I decided I'm not going to leave the house until I find a way to escape hell. I can't spend another day like this. I went. I remember putting my answer machine, locking my door. I said, I'm not going anywhere. I went to the same book and I opened Romans. 
I figured as a doctor, this book probably gives you the disease first and it gives you the cure afterwards. So I'm gonna look for the pure chapter. And I was going through Romans two, Romans three, I'm going fast. I came across a verse or two in Romans chapter three. There is no one good, not even one. I said, wait a minute, mm -hmm. I'm not the only one. Everybody is guilty. So I figured everybody's going to hell, but I still <laughs> didn't want to go to hell. So I continued Romans four, five, six, and then I reach where God saved me, Romans six, 23. And Pastor Chuck, it was like time took a pause. I never forgot that moment. And not only this, there was a light beaming in my brain. I couldn't believe it. It was like a neon light that just shone there. And time is pausing. And I'm reading those, those words so slowly. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The voice that came the night before came back and explained it to me. It said, you deserve to go to hell. To which Pastor Chuck, I went, I know, but I would like to give you heaven as the gift. Would you take it? I said, wait a minute. This is too good to be true. Who wrote this book? So I went to the first page and then Holy Bible, uh, Library of the Congress, American <laughs> Bible Society. Wait a minute. Maybe this is the real thing. Maybe this is a real offer. Maybe I should give it a try. And Pastor Chuck, I decided in a moment, I said, yes. That's all I did. To a very strange offer that makes no sense whatsoever to me. I'm guilty, yes. I'm a sinner, yes. I'm going to hell, yes. But someone to give me heaven like this? on account of Jesus Christ. So I said, yes. And the moment I did that, Pastor Chuck, my fears just immediately vanished. There was a peace that came upon me and joy. I'm gonna burst out of joy. I knew something happened to me. I didn't know what it was, but I knew something happened to me. I was on my knees the next moment, crying and weeping. And the next day I was devouring the book. I had not met one Christian yet, devouring the book, 50 chapter, 60 chapters a day, asking, going to libraries, do you have any books that explain the Bible? And uh, I remember one library, one bookstore said, in the back, there's religion. I remember going in the back, there was books about sorcery, books about the Bible. Oh. I picked up a book or two about the Bible. It wasn't except a few days later, on my way out from work, rushing to go home to read the Bible, a doctor crosses me in the elevator. He was a Jewish man, unsaved. And he said, where are you going tonight? You must have a good day. I said, no. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm not going to tell you. He insisted and insisted. I said, okay, I'm going home to read the Bible. And I never forgot. He pointed his finger at me. He said, Ray, are you okay? I said, I told you. It's very funny. It happened to me a few days ago. I cannot stop reading the Bible. My life was changed. He looked at me. He was a physician. He said, Ray, are you a born again Christian? I said, I never heard that word before. I don't know. He goes, yes, you are. I said, really? Is this what they call someone like me whose life was changed through a verse or two in the Bible? He said, yes. And I asked him, I said, his name was John. I said, John, do you know of any other people like me? He said, oh, yes. I said, could you please tell me where they are? And then the rest of the story is history. Praise God. Leading me step by step. Okay. I love that. Oh, my gosh. I love how God got a hold of you. Um, on my conversion, I won't tell the whole thing because most everyone already knows it, but I actually felt God grab my on each side of my shoulders. Like I felt him and he pushed me out in the aisle to go forward. And I'm like, and he, yet there was nobody there. And you heard God speaking to you, which, oh my gosh, that's so cool. And, just, and I think I love how God wants us so badly that God pursues us and Amazing. opens our eyes. Amazing. Yeah. Now I asked you this before, but we're hearing these incredible stories in the Middle East of people who are Muslims 
that have a dream of Jesus and come to know Christ. Are you hearing those stories too? Yeah, uh, Pastor Chuck, I met many of those people. Uh, I I went to Lebanon, me and my wife, about a year and a half ago. We spent uh, a few weeks there, and we went to uh, visit several churches, and I saw so many of those converts. In one of them, uh, this is a, a, at least I started with that one church in Zahli, my hometown. Uh, the pastor built a church that has mushroomed to a huge church, and he's a man like you who walks by faith, etc. He saw God just putting on his heart to reach out to the Syrian refugees, and there are about a million yeah. of those in his backyard. He told me literally, he said, Ray, this area needs about 200 churches full time here. He said, I cannot, they're coming to us, like you said, having seen visions, having heard voices, having whatever, they, they come to us and say, how can I get saved? Or how can I know this person who's trying to talk to me? And he said, we're not hardly going knocking at the door. They're coming knocking at our door. And I remember going and listening to story after story. Uh, we went to that one house, several converts in it, ladies, and they had to sit on the floor. And you hear one story after another, one story after another, the same thing. When Jesus grab, gets hold of someone, doesn't let go until they know him. And you should see how they're willing and ready to sacrifice their life. Many of them, I mean, one of them said, pray for me. My brother has been sending me nasty messages. He sent her in an envelope, a bullet. He said, oh. this is just a preview of what I'm coming to you with. She said, he wants to kill me because I am an infidel now. I became a Christian. And we sat, I remember with her, she's praying for him. She said, I don't care if he kills me or not, as long as he comes to know the Lord Jesus. Wow. So this is the kind of atmosphere. We met so many of these people, Pastor Chuck. And I want to tell you, Pastor Chuck, we Lebanese, after my conversion, I went a few times. But in the last few years, there is a movement of conversion in Lebanon in particular that has never been seen before among Muslims. That is so awesome and so incredible. Um, and you know what I, I love is that what we're seeing is the book of Acts lived out. It's just the, what the Bible says happens is what's happening. You know, so God speaking, uh, God giving dreams, God giving visions, God grabbing people. I mean, because in the Bible, all those things happen and it's all happening today. And, and Pastor Shaka, when I tell you, speaking about God, God grabbing you, I remember the first Sunday of that last visit, year and a half ago, and uh, I was asked to speak at that church in Zahli, and uh, and we were going to work with the, I mean, they have a meeting on the hour. It just continues day by day. These are not just once or twice or three times a week. They meet, they broke the meetings into meetings of believers, meeting of those who are searching, people, people who have searched and are ready to be baptized, people who are getting to be baptized. And they go from one meeting to another. I entered a meeting, and Pastor Chuck, I couldn't believe it. I started weeping and crying. I felt, like you said, God gripping me as a believer, like I'm here in this room. And I started weeping. I turned around, and I asked my wife for a handkerchief. I said, and I looked at her. She's weeping. I looked at everybody. They're weeping. At the end of a small sermon, I don't think I had a chance to say with anybody when I accept Christ. You could hear people crying and screaming. I need to be saved. I'm a sinner. Help me. Look. I mean, I looked around. What is this? I've never seen this. Pastor Chuck. But you're right. God is on the move there like never before. Yeah, I just love that's happening. And I know you do, too. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. I, I read a book. Uh, and so I so much that I'd like to ask you to make a trip over there yourself, please, and see it for yourself. Oh, OK. All right. That would be Tracy <laughs> going to Lebanon. With Tracy, of course. Yeah, yeah. Tracy would love to do it. Yeah. Um, a guy in our church actually said he would help that happen. I forgot who that was. But you know what? I'd love to go do that. My wife, Pam, would love to even more. Um, Amen. And just to be a part of what's happening. Uh, let me just say that one, one more thing about my wife. I told my wife the next day we're going to go and uh, uh, treat those refugees as a physician. We're going to have like, and they asked me, how many can you handle? 100, 200? I said, well, you know, how many hours? So they said, okay, we'll give you 50, 55. Because people are at the door and they open those clinics. And I remember my wife at first, she said, 
should I go? Because it's risky. What if I get a disease? Uh, Pastor Chuck, after about two, three patients, my wife said, I don't want to leave this place. Wow. She loved those people. And they were so lovable and so vulnerable and so searching for Jesus that we, she, my wife said, you should see more patients. And I want to be with you on every one of them. Oh, my, that's awesome. That is so cool. And by the way, the, the need isn't just with the refugees. It's actually now um, in Beirut, if I'm right, Absolutely. and what happened. Um, and so you, I think you have a video that shows what the streets of Beirut look like. We're going to show right now and uh, the devastation that's there. Uh, tell us a little bit about the devastation that occurred in Beirut. Uh, Pastor Chuck, you said it. It's one of the worst explosions in the world. In fact, it's third after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Something unbelievable. Somebody left 275 tons of ammonium nitrate in a hangar in the port without knowing they're there. I mean, it's hard to believe, but be it as it may, for whatever reason, this thing exploded at 6, 10 p.m. on August 4th, and the rest is history. We know several people whose home were damaged. One of them is my, 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 my sister, who's 88 years old, my mm -hmm. oldest sister. And uh, thank God she was safe because she sat in a corner, but the front of the house came caving down. People died, people suddenly, people changed suddenly. I think this was a message not only for Lebanon, but it was a message for the whole world that our world can cave on us, down on us any moment. We cannot predict what's going to happen the next moment, and we need to be ready. So this is a message that is taken not only for Lebanon, and I hope and pray the Lebanese will take it. My belief, as you know yourself, mm -hmm. is that the promises of God for Lebanon are soon to happen. And one of them, of course, my favorite is in Isaiah 29, 17 to 25. Is it not yet a little while that Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field on that day the ears of the deaf shall hear and the eyes of the blind shall see and the humble and the poor shall rejoice in the god of israel so this day is coming and i believe god is soon going to do it because this is a real tragedy we need to come and be the elements or the hands and feet of god to be part of that wow Wow, you really brought that passage to life. I mean, I'm preaching on Isaiah starting in September. Um, and I mm. love how in the book of Isaiah, it talks about how God is reaching beyond the nation of Israel and the children of Israel to all nations and to all people so that they can come to know him. And I also, I, I do know, I picked up right away that Lebanon singled just, out just as so a that, place like Just that. so that I didn't give you the, the wrong, uh, the wrong uh, uh, verse, but it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's Isaiah... At 29 verse 17. I okay. hope I said that correctly. 29 verse 17 to 25. Yeah. Well, that's really cool. By the way, if you get an way, Isaiah one, journal, you'll find that verse in there. <laughs> yeah. Because we have one. one on of 75 places that Lebanon was mentioned in the Bible. Yeah. So God has something special for Lebanon still to come. So right now, um, are, are you a part of doing work to help the people in Lebanon? Absolutely. And what do you uh, do? Our organization, I'm part of an organization that started as a prayer organization only. It's called the Lebanon Prayer Group. And Lebanon Prayer Group has been has prayed for Lebanon for 30 years. Every year we have a, a big meeting. And I hope Pastor Chuck will be with us next year. Hopefully the corona is over and we can have a lot of people there. Maybe one day we'll have it if you invite us to your, your church. We'd love to. And people come from everywhere. And, uh, and you should see them pleading for the different countries of the Middle East and for the United States. And as when this meeting first started 30 years ago, it was exactly 1990. Lebanon has gone through 15 years of one of the worst civil wars. It was a time where it was in desperation. Uh, we came on that day, we made it public, we put announcement in the newspapers, and people came from everywhere because, and everybody thought it was hopeless. Lebanon was hopeless on that day. Uh, everything was destroyed at that time in it. And uh, after that first prayer to the, to the month, in October 13, 1990, the war, the, 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 the cannons stopped suddenly in Lebanon. Wow. We were so surprised that, is it possible that our prayer did it or had part in it? 
sure enough, it started getting better and better, and Lebanon was rebuilt. And we started increasing that day to become day of prayer for the Arab world, then for the Middle East, United States, etc. It continued for 30 years. Pastor Chuck, I want to tell you that God gave Lebanon 30 years of like mercy that was time for 30 years. I think now he's asking us to go for an additional mercy, but now more than mercy. He wants to do something triumphal, something victorious, something that says, I am the God that doesn't just give peace. I'm the guy, the God of transformation, of making a revival like nobody else. Amen. Amen. By the way, I'll go ahead and do it. Um, if the coronavirus is over and we can meet in our building, I'm going to invite you. We'll set that up for sure. I'd love and to. love to have you here. Love to have that prayer service here. Um, and Amen. if not, uh, and, if, and what else? I, I, Pam and I will go. <laughs> we'll go to be with you. We'd love to do that. Um, so right now, though, about relief efforts that are going on, I know we're in the midst of talking as a church about being a part of doing something to bring real care, real, real um, um, rescue, real uh, provision. Um, so are you a part of that, too, right now? Are you guys raising money for I'm that? I'm a part of that. We have connection with many churches. We have been doing lately, before that explosion happened, books for Lebanon. We want to mm -hmm. we want to fill Lebanon with books. And we're partnering with another organization from the East Coast that have the same thing on their heart. So now books, the, the Bible is spreading Lebanon because a lot of people, uh, in fact, one pastor told me, it's so many people ask for, for books, we don't have enough books. I said, no problem. So we are covering every city, every town, every place. In fact, one guy, he runs a big hospital in Lebanon. He said, can you get me a lot of those books? Because I want to give them to every patient. I said, no problem. So we are sending books, books, and then came the explosion. We're going to continue with the book project, of course. But now we need to bring relief because yeah. churches were destroyed. Uh, schools were destroyed. Hospitals were destroyed. People are really in a dire need right now. And whatever we can send is so appreciated and will bring so much thanksgiving to our Lord and so much encouragement. And, and just to tell you also, uh, Brother uh, Pastor Chuck, uh, we have happened to have some money aside. We decided to match any gift ourselves, the Lebanon Prayer Group. So Lebanon Prayer Group would not take a dime out of these this money. It goes double to the different churches, and we'll give an account to all about all the churches. Yesterday I was telling a list, and the list is getting bigger. More and more churches that I never knew about. They're saying, please help, please help, please help, please help. So the list is bigger than than. We can handle, but whatever the Lord sends will go. Okay, that. yeah. And, uh, you know, right now, I think this is a time where Christians need to unite together. And uh, to do that in the Middle East, uh, I think, has an opportunity to create a ripple effect beyond Lebanon, even, uh, that we would be able to go and make a difference, go and show Jesus is real, go and show that Christians unite. Um, and, and the cool thing about that is we unite to help, not hurt. We unite to stand and care and to show love. And I think that will shine out huge in the Middle East. Don't you think so? Amen. Yeah. Amen. In the words of one uh, refugee uh, who was one of my last patients on one day in Zahli, uh, she said, I want to hang around and I want to ask you some questions after everybody is gone. I said, I have no problem. And my wife was still there. And she came to me. She said, after everybody is gone, and we had seen many patients on that day, et cetera, et cetera. She said to me, who's the one who sent you here to love us like this? Yeah. I want to know him. I said, you know probably who he is. She said, I heard about him. But I want to know him because she said, I've never seen people love us like you. Wow. <laughs> and I want to tell you, Pastor Chuck. The love of Jesus is touching people so much that yeah. people coming from every background, they say, we've never seen love like this. And I think this is how we can make an impact right now. Oh, I agree. I agree. Well, our time is up. It flew by. It just flew by. But Dr. Slayman, I really, I, I'm honored to meet you. Brother I'm Ray so is enough. Oh, Brother Ray, <laughs> Brother Ray. Okay, uh, I, I, um, I just love that. But I love that we got to meet each other. I've heard a lot about you from Tracy, obviously, and everything just so, so good. Um, so did I. But I would love to do this. Can we pray 
uh, for um, your ministry and also pray for what's happening in Lebanon right now. And so yes. I'd like to pray for you. Please. Okay. Father, I thank you so much for uh, Ray, Brother Ray. And I love that we're brothers and you. And I love for the way that you spoke to him. At a time, he didn't know you, but he knew the voice was you and it was kind and caring. And your kindness led to his repentance, just like it says in Romans. And uh, Lord, then he ended up going on this amazing journey with you all these years of having you pour into him, love him, bring him to his wife, bring him to great ministry. I pray you'd bless his ministry here and his ministry in Lebanon. I pray you'd bless the care he gives here and the care that he's giving in Lebanon. And I pray, oh God, that this is an opportunity, this moment for us as Christians to go and be lights in the midst of darkness and hope in the midst of fear, and that we would see your love, as as Brother Ray said, transform people because no one loves like you do. And you want us to go love in your name. And I think you, he's doing that. And I think you get to partner in that in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you Pastor very Chuck, much. A delight. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Have a great day. So as we close, I want to tell you something, everybody. It was the book of Romans that brought Ray to Christ. He read the book of Romans, went through it, and that's how he came to know the Lord. This weekend, this Sunday, I'm going to teach you how to take the book of Romans and show somebody how they can come to faith in Christ and beyond. So it's called the Roman Roadmap to Salvation because Romans actually does that. It gives you a roadmap for knowing why you need Jesus, that the disease of sin, the cure to the disease, as Dr. Ray said, and then on the other side, what happens when you live that life? So what is it? It's your before Christ, your something happened, and now what? all found in the book of Romans. So we'll be doing that this Sunday. And he, you know, he talked about Isaiah. We're going to be doing Isaiah in September. If you don't have an Isaiah journal yet, you need to get an Isaiah journal. So go to amazon.com, search Chuck Boer, and up will pop the Isaiah journal, both in English and in Spanish. And uh, starting September 7th, we're going to go through it together. And, I, and I'm going to take you through the book of Isaiah, which has so many amazing passages in it that are relevant to your life. But uh, I'm so glad you were with us. I hope that this touched you the way it touched me. And if it did, I'd like you to do this. Hit like and the like, but also even more, go ask somebody else to watch it. Tell them either watch it or listen to the podcast and hear what, what happened in the life of a man who did not know Jesus, came to know Jesus as a doctor, by the way, and now was being used by Jesus. So God bless you till we meet again. Excited we got to be together. <laughs>